So we started off with Psalm 23, uh, which I think is just a really good personal overview of the Christian journey. So we're going along righteous paths. Um, it's righteous, a righteous path because it takes us to the right place, the shepherd's house. Um, we're in the company with the right person, the shepherd, and by staying with him along this path, we become the right people. We become like the shepherd. We become righteous like him. Um, but of course, as we noted along that path, there are green grass, there's green grass and quiet waters, but there's also the valley of the shadow of death and there's a table surrounded by enemies. S but sort of the insight we got from the very beginning was when we're walking with God, there may come times where things are not as we expect, but don't be worried. The shepherd is still with us. Um, then we looked at four important reasons, um, four main reasons why suffering happens. So Satan is at work in the world. We sin and we reap the consequences of, of those sins, and that's often painful. Um, God works to purify us. That's where we get this idea of crucible, um, this intense heated place for God to burn out the purities, impurities so we can reflect him more fully. And then this um, final um, reason where God sometimes is going to prune us for greater fruitfulness coming from uh, John 15. And then we looked at some of the biblical examples. We've been coming lots of different examples through the Bible of God not just being involved in someone's difficult life, but sometimes leading to places where we will be tested and find ourselves, maybe we'll be fearful or shocked or we, we will be disturbed in some way. And the pain is coming from within us. It's our carnal nature. We, we don't want to be purified. <laughs> we don't want to be in a refiner's fire. Uh, and even though intellectually we want to be like Jesus, the process for going through it, where God has to deal with the deep-rooted sin within me, that's, that's a difficult process. Um, but through it all, God is present and he's doing something for our very good. And of course, we looked at Abraham and Job and, and Joseph and, and Paul. Um, lots of um, situations that people find us, found themselves in where God was doing something within them or he was doing something through them in order to, for them to be of service to other people. And I think that's one of, um, for me, particularly in, in Paul in, in Corinthians, where he talks about the comfort we have received from God, we're passing on to you. So God takes him to a position where he goes through some stuff. He needs to call out to God, receive comfort. So when he sees me or you, he says, OK, I know how this works. Let me help you through this. And so it's about journeying together to the shepherd's uh, front door. So through all of this, God is, is desiring for us to learn how to become more dependent on him, to trust him, to, to allow him to lead us. What, what are some of the, the positive results of us learning to depend on him? What, what does that give us? Well, as, as we've looked at, right, when we depend on God, firstly, when I yield myself, we talked about the call to death. Um, my, I, I, I am becoming empty of my own sinful nature. And that provides the opportunity that creates the vacuum for the Holy Spirit to fill us. And of course, once the Holy Spirit is filled and the Bible talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and of course, this takes us into a, a whole new area. Um, but when, when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, Jesus is talking about this baptism of the Holy Spirit that the disciples need to have in order to take the gospel to the world. So. And, le and when the Holy Spirit comes within me, all of the graces and the power that are necessary for mission and taking the gospel to the world can be found uh, within us. And that's why God wants us to bring us to that point of dependence. And that's, of course, where we are finding out more about hope and patience and meekness and all of those other things that we really don't like. 
And so we've seen the, the importance of surrendering self, allowing Jesus through the Holy Spirit to come in to, to change us, to turn us into who he wants us to be, certainly for his glory, but also to share his glory and his, his love with others. There's a, there are a lot of different texts that we could look at this week to, to kind of help us understand Christ in the crucible. But I think one of the significant ones, one of the most significant ones, is in Isaiah chapter 53. This is the, the great gospel chapter, the chapter about the Messiah in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. And one, one might even contest one of the greatest chapters in the Old Testament about the Messiah. What's in this chapter? Well, an awful lot. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, it's, uh, it's so significant. Um, Ellen White said that everyone should memorize this chapter uh, because we, there are so many different aspects of, of who Jesus is. And of course, in the same way as we've looked at previously, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we are to imitate his example. So we have painted this amazing picture of the, the suffering of Christ, uh, uh, realizing that as he needed to go through this to serve others, we may be called to follow in that path. Uh, so we're going to take some time to sort of go slowly through this and, and, and just sort of unpack what's there. And that also helps to give us a, a way of thinking, uh, some glasses when we look at New Testament texts to, to understand what what's, uh, the New Testament authors are talking about. So let's, let's begin to, to look at the first three verses. And in these first three verses, we see the humiliation of Jesus. Let me start with verse one. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. And these these are these are profound words. Um, he describes, if you think about this as a picture of Jesus, he's described a, as a root out of dry ground. Well, I mean, let's think about this. This is our Creator. This is the God who created the whole universe, our King. And. He, it says he has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. And I was reading this the other day and I was thinking, okay, why? Why is no one attracted to Jesus? And I was sort of reading around the subject and uh, one author w was bringing up this idea that of course, when Jesus appeared, he stood for a certain type of kingdom. Israel at the time had very different ideas. They had plans for a very earthly, physical kingdom. It was going to overthrow the Romans and you know, all sorts of stuff. So when God's people looked at Jesus, uh, he wasn't what they were looking for. Um, you know, what was Jesus coming for? Um, we're not interested in that stuff. Um, there was nothing in them that resonated what was in him, uh, or what they saw when, what, what, yeah, what, what they saw when they saw him, and you know this is this is a little bit challenging um, that I might find myself in a situation where my dreams and ambitions are God are go for God are going this way, and because God's ambitions are in a different place. I don't recognize him. There's nothing attractive with him. And so I kind of put God to one side because my dreams have become so cemented in my thinking and in my heart that I'm just somewhere else. An interesting picture of him. I was, I was talking with someone not too long ago who had just watched a 
a movie about Jesus, a film, a series about Jesus. And when she saw the actor who portrayed Jesus, she, oh, I don't want to watch this. He's, he's ugly. And I thought, that's interesting because the, the Bible says, you know, there's, there's nothing about him that would draw us to him, you know, from a, a, a physical standpoint. And, but there's something in him. It, was, it wasn't about what he looked like, but the words he said, the life that he lived. That's what made the biggest impact. And if we think about, you know, zipping forward, um, it's at the foot washing that Judas leaves. There is something humiliating about what Jesus is doing for the disciples. And it seems that Judas said, well, that's not the guy I was anticipating. I'm out of here. Uh, and he leaves. And, you know, if we think about this, this challenge and we go back to Eden, because Eden's always interesting because there you've got the kind of the foundation of, of sin. Um, why does Eve eat the fruit? She had ambitions that were beyond or separate from what God was looking for. And she, 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 because of her ambitions, she learns to dis, well, is caused to distrust God's wisdom and she relies on her own. And we all know where that took us all and everyone after her um, because her ambitions for herself and for Adam were just so very different from what God says. It's interesting in this, uh, in this passage in Isaiah, there's, uh, I came across this passage in the Youth Instructor from 1900. Um, it's, a, it's a comment on these verses in Isaiah. And the author writes, those who are lifted up by pride whose souls are filled with vanity should look upon this picture of their Redeemer and humble themselves in the dust. And am I willing to do that? It's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Gavin, you've been walking us through Isaiah 53. The first three verses gives us an idea of who Jesus was, what he was like. Let's jump down into verses four through six now. Right, so first three verses, the humiliation of Jesus. Um, now we're looking at the suffering of Jesus. Okay, let me read verse four to six. Surely who took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity, iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, if we start, we look at these, these first few verses in, in, in verse four and five, it says Jesus was full of sorrows. He was pierced, he was crushed, beaten and whipped. And, and uh, Isaiah is, is very clear, and it was something that I, it just didn't really strike me until very recently. It's not just the death of Jesus that saved us. He, he says the suffering of Jesus saved us. Um, what these, this suffering led to our healing, it was part of his mission towards us and to be, to be honest, I'm not sure I really grasp um, the significance of all of this. Um, but verse six kind of ends with, with this punchline. Isaiah wants us to make sure of one thing very clear. Um, everything that he suffered, it was because of all of us. My sin, your sin, our sin at home. Um, and, but the problem is that we think that it's everyone else who's got the problem, it's not me. And I think this is the great challenge uh, to realize that what Isaiah is saying is right, this is about me, I have to make a response to this. My sin caused that suffering, and that, but that suffering has brought about my healing. Um, and again, if we go back to Genesis uh, 3 into, into Eden, um, you know, we've been talking about the fact that, you know, it's not me, it's you. And, and that's what we see. The moment sin comes in, 
Adam says, you know, it's not me, it's the woman. The woman says, no, not me, it's the snake. Um, you know, and I think what, we, what God is saying here in this passage is like, stop this nonsense. Stop passing the buck. It's about you, it's about me. Um, take responsibility and stop pointing your fingers at other people because we do so much finger pointing uh, but all it does is, is, is hurt and damage us even more. And I think this is the great challenge. You know, am I ready to recognize and accept that what I have been doing in the last few weeks, last few days, my interactions with, with other people, that has actually caused the suffering of Jesus that Isaiah is describing. That's sobering to, to say the least, to realize that we're the ones to come to grips, to come to terms with the facts that we are the ones responsible for Jesus' death. You're right, it is easy. It's easier to always put the blame on somebody else. It's his hurt fault, it's her fault, it's their fault that I'm going through this. But the reality is the reason that we're dealing with sin is to a great extent because of us. You know, we, we've made poor choices and, and we're seeing the results of that. We live in a sinful fallen world and we're seeing the results of that. Jesus died because of all that, for all that, so that we could have hope. So we've looked at the humiliation of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus. We get into verses seven through nine and we see something else. Yes, well, here's the silence of Jesus. And we did touch on this um, in, in previous episode, but I think in the context, it's good just to remind ourselves briefly of this. Uh, let me read this through again. Verse seven, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was, was there any deceit in his mouth. And again, we, we kind of, you see this, the, all of these things that are landing on Jesus um, that is bringing pain uh, and suffering. He didn't deserve any of this. And, and he closes his mouth. He doesn't justify himself. He leaves that to God. And as we brought out previously, I think one of, one, one of the aspects or reasons that he, he said nothing is because he wasn't wanting to debate with Satan. Again, just like Eve in the Garden of Eden, you start debating and you, you go to some very bad places. Um, but the silence also, he is in the hands of his father. He, he knows where he is. He doesn't have to justify, he doesn't have to explain. He is in the center of his father's hand and therefore he can rest and leave his situation in the stream of God's providence. An, an incredible example of how we should live our lives. Let's bring Isaiah 53 kind of together with verses 10 through 12. Let me read, starting at verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And you know, here, you know, verse 10 sort of really <laughs> sets up this sort of paradox. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him to suffer. Well, that's just offensive. And I, I guess it perhaps is no different in one sense to many of the examples that we've been seeing. Um, you know, is, is, is this really God's plan? Um, is this the way God operates? Uh, but of course, it's only through death that new life comes that we'd be seeing over and over again. Um, does God lead his 
dearly beloved people, his dearly beloved son in, in such places? Yes, because through resurrection is life and the salvation of many. And that is why we are here today, because of that grace. Gavin, we've been on a journey for 13 weeks, looking at how God brings his children into the crucible with Christ in order that, that new life, new hope might come through that experience. In the few minutes that we have remaining, are there any Bible passages, any thoughts, any observations that, that we really ought to have resonating in our ears, in our minds as we, as we bring this quarter to a close? Well, we've just been kind of just listening to scripture um, and I want to read a, another chunk to answer your question. And this is from 2 Corinthians. And I think as we've been listening and thinking about some of these texts and feeling our own frailty and recognizing how we have all messed up in this so badly. I think Paul comes in with some very encouraging words here. This is 2 Corinthians 4, um, starting at verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And of course, this is the resurrection power that we've got because of Jesus. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So we've just been kind of focusing on that. He said, we, we, we carry that around so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So it's not, death is not the end. There's resurrection and resurrection power afterwards. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's powerful, profound, deep and praise the Lord for Paul for giving us something like that. Any final thoughts before we have prayer? Yes. Um, I suppose when I think about everything, we're going to summarize it in, in a little nutshell. You and I, all human beings, were designed and created in the image of God to reveal the glory of the character of God for the honor of God. And in order for God to accomplish that process, we may have to go through the crucible. But when we submit to God's leading, even though it's tough, the glory of God revealed through the character of God, through the spirit that is within us, will give a testimony to the truth about who God is. And that's what the world needs to see today. Gavin, thank you for taking us on this journey through understanding suffering in the Christian life. It, it helps us to cope by the grace of God with the challenges that we face. Would you offer a final prayer for us, please? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will give us minds that are, that we're single-minded for your glory. Give us hearts that long to honor you, no matter what life throws on our path. For eyes that continually search for the resurrected Christ, so that we can reflect him more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.